Hello, and welcome to the CPA Ontario Practical Experience Webinar, Part 101, Practical Experience Reporting Basics. This webinar is developed for CPA Ontario students completing their practical experience, and it will offer you a chance to ask your most pressing questions. While I provide you with the overview of the CPA Practical Experience Program, we encourage you to begin asking questions through the Questions tab on the left of your screen. Your question will either be answered directly by one of our members of the Practical Experience team, or if your question is relevant to all other students, we will answer it openly. If we do not answer your question within this time period of the webinar, we will respond to your question via email as soon as possible. Good afternoon, my name is Amanda Lisho and I am a Practical Experience Officer and I work directly with reviewing Practical Experience Reports, among other things. Today, we will be discussing the following. One, the CPA Certification Program Overview. Two, your requirements within the Practical Experience Requirement as a CPA student. And three, we will go over some key questions and answers, as well as answer any questions you may have publicly. So let's jump right in. As you progress through each stage of the CPA certification program, you'll be able to choose a path that suits your learning and lifestyle. It is also important to recognize the CPA certification program is designed to meet the needs of the industry, government, and public practice by ensuring all CPAs coming out of the program have a strong foundation of knowledge and skill as professional accountants need to succeed in whatever role you take on in the future, regardless of the path you select to getting there. All of you were invited because you had registered for the Core 1 um, module this spring. As you can see here, the academic part, so your education and practical experience, run simultaneously. And you are required to document your practical experience throughout your education process. So once you are registered with CP Ontario, you should be getting into PERT. I will take a few moments now to go over what exactly the CPA practical experience requirements are in case some of you have questions. The CPA practical experience requirements combine practical experience and mentorship over the course of a minimum of 30 months duration and under the guidance of a CPA mentor for these 30 months. Students will meet your core depth, breadth, breadth, and progression of the technical competencies, which I will cover shortly, as well as meeting all the enabling competencies at a level two proficiency. If you're not sure about the levels, I will also be discussing this a little later. Students will need to report their progression through self-assessment in PERTS, and while doing so, they need to be proving that they are having their mentor reviews as well documented in PERTS. I will now speak about some of these competency requirements as this is an area that most students struggle with when they begin reporting in PERT. Let's take a deeper look. So we have six technical competency areas and they are um, financial reporting, management accounting, strategy and governance, taxation, finance, and audit insurance. You do not need to achieve competency in all six areas, and I will continue to explain further as I discuss about the core depth and breadth requirements. What you do need to meet in full are your enabling competencies, and these are those that are more of the softer skills and cover professional and ethical behavior, problem solving and decision making, communication, self-management, and teamwork and leadership. These are areas that we feel are important to be covered if you are a new, newly certified CPA. I'm going to dive deeper now into the technical competency area, your core, which is probably one of the first things you will meet. In order to meet your core requirement, you must meet at least one level one proficiency, at least three level one proficiency in either financial reporting or management accounting. As you can see on this wheel, each of these 
competency areas have four sub-competency areas. So you only need to meet three of these eight at a level one proficiency. These areas include financial reporting needs and systems, accounting policies and transactions, financial report preparation, financial statement analysis. For management accounting, it includes management reporting needs and systems, planning, budget, and forecasting, cost, revenue, or profitability management, and individual or, individ or organizational performance management. The other area you will need to gain is an area of depth. To gain proficiency in depth, you will need to gain proficiency in all of the sub-competency areas of one discrete main competency area. For example, on the screen right now, you will see that this student has achieved a depth in finance because they've achieved at least all of the competency areas with at least two of them being at a level two. The others may be at a level one. So in this case, the student has achieved a level two in financial planning and analysis, treasury management, and then a level one in capital budgeting, valuation, and corporate finance, meaning the student has successfully achieved a depth area in finance. The last technical competency requirement would be your breadth. So in order to achieve breadth, a student is required to gain proficiency in at least eight sub-competency areas with at least four sub-competency areas gained at a level two and the remaining at a level one. So through combining your core and depth, you may be able to achieve most of these eight areas and then your breadth area would be anywhere else. So if you look at this screen right now, a student has achieved their depth in finance. So they have two level twos and one level one, but have completed the entire sub-competency area. They have their core, so they have achieved at least three of the financial reporting or management accounting subcompetencies at a minimum of a level one. And then they have achieved their breadth because overall they have four level twos and four level ones throughout this, um, these competency areas. Another great thing to point out is, as you can see, the student has not achieved any uh, proficiency in taxation as they are really not required to. This area um, of the enabling subcompetencies is an area where students also tend to struggle most, and this is not necessarily struggle in achieving these experiences, but more so a struggle in documentation of the enabling competencies to reach a level two um, standard. And so the subcompetency areas here all need to be achieved at a level two by the time you are at the entry level requirement of a CPA, so toward the end of the 30 month duration. And um, in this case, we expect most students to slowly develop on their experiences. So we would not expect a student who's at an entry level role to really be at a self-management type um, position. However, through being in a role for X amount of months, maybe let's say 24, a student might be able to have a, a strong example of how they were able to demonstrate self-management. Again, it is really important to be able to communicate and document your responses. And so we have a blue information icon in PERT beside each of the enabling competencies that will walk you through the rubric of which the CPA reviewers will review your documentation against. So make sure that when you are documenting both your enabling and technical competencies that you are taking a look at these rubrics as guidance. Also, the role of your mentor would be to help you um, with your enabling competency documentation and progression. So this is the area where you would most speak with your mentor and discuss where um, you know you might feel like you need a little bit more help or maybe areas where you are unsure on how to progress, you can speak to your mentor to help build that competency area. So you heard me speak about the levels of progression and now I'll, I'll speak to them a little bit more. So we have three levels um, within the levels of progression, so level zero, a level one, and a level two. Throughout your practical experience, you're expected to progress and perform more complex and less routine work with more autonomy. And this is why we require at least a minimum of 30 months duration. 
and why you as a student should be consistently reporting your experience. Therefore, um, we would expect a student to really be at a level zero in an entry level position. So if you look at this slide here, we have um, verbs that are typically used to explain this. And so for level zero approaching a level one, you'd be really doing the um, explaining, applying, recording, and calculating type work. So, um, and as you can see, as you move into the level one, you would then take this work and analyze or identify issues or research or take this information and prepare something, whether it be maybe prepare a document or a memo, um, but really be able to analyze the information and prepare some sort of document. Um, and then to get to that level two, you would be uh, evaluating or reviewing or advising or providing a recommendation um, through your analysis. So we definitely don't expect students to be at the level two right away. Right away, um, It's really unlikely that you would be. So keep this in mind as you're self-assessing throughout your entire 30-month duration to make sure that you are being reasonable with your analysis. So in summary, um, we would like to make sure you familiarize yourself with the CPA practical experience terminology, as you will hear these terms often and it is important to know what they are. As a CPA student that is registered in PEP, you will have a lot of opportunity to be invited to future CPA Ontario practical experience webinars and we encourage you to join these webinars if they're applicable to you. Um, Practical experience involves 30 months of duration, mentorship, and reporting, and I will go through a little bit of each um, after this segment, and a maximum of 12 months prior to your PER effective date. So this date is generated once you do get into PER and have your role recognized. You are able to claim 12 months of prior experience from this date. Um, and you can go back up to five and a half years of practical experience. So if you had done co-op terms in the past and hadn't gone into PERT or you had a part-time job or a job over the summer as a student, let's say, you can claim some of this experience if it qualifies. You need to complete two mentor reviews for every 12 months of current experience gained after your PERT effective date. So again, remember, your PERT effective date was set in your PERT profile once you were enrolled or accepted in your, your current role. And we need to see that you're able to progress from level zero to level two in some of your proficiency um, areas and competency. So, um, I would definitely recommend you take some time to ask some questions right now through uh, through the question tool while I show you some key features in PERT. And then at the end of this presentation, I will um, read out some, some good questions and go over some areas should there be time permitting. So um, this is what PERT would look like if you were to log in and you would be able to see a list of your experience reports. So it is important to note that these areas up over here that are highlighted in green are clickable. So right now we're on the experience report tab, but we have um, other tabs that are clickable. For example, the consolidated summary tab, the mentor reviews tab, which is where you would go to request a mentor review, and a profession assessment tab, which is where you would go to, to request that CPA Ontario reviews your experience report. In order to gain access to your experience report, you can see here that they are listed and you have your status, your name of your employer, and the period you reported. It is important to note that you should not be overlapping your experience report dates as your experience reports will be um, either sent back for editing or manually adjusted uh, of your duration. Another good thing to take a look at is your report type. So if you see here, a, this student specifically has current experience and prior experience reported. In order to get into your experience report, you really do need to click on any of the blue areas which are essentially clickable. So if I were to click here in either the employer or the position, I would be able to open the experience report.
So this experience report had been submitted already, but let's say I wanted to make an edit to this experience report. I would click on the reopen button to edit. Otherwise, this button would read edit. Okay. Um, if I wanted to start documenting or self-assess my technical competency area, again, along the top here are tabs. And so right now we are on the report details tab, but if I were to click the technical competencies tab, I would be um, directed to this page right here, where I'm able to click within the competency area I want to report and report my experience. So now, let's say I wanted to click into financial reporting and document some of my experience here. Again, anything blue on the screen is clickable. So I click into here and now I am at the area where I'm able to document my professional, uh, my technical experience here in my role. So this example um, is that of a student in a pre-approved program. So this documentation, so the area where it says describe in detail the duties you performed, is pre-populated because CPI Ontario and my employer have worked together to create um, a program that CPI Ontario has approved. However, if you are in the experience verification route, this area would be left blank and you would be able to document what you've done to support this competency. As I mentioned previously, we have this, these blue information icons everywhere in PERG, and it would be um, our best advice to you to click within it and understand what is required um, to meet a level zero, a one, or a two in each subcompetency area so that you um, have your expectation, I guess, sort of set straight and you know what you need to do to get to the level one or two should you desire. So if I click within the blue information icon here, I see that, you know, preparing simple reconciliations and verifying the mathematical accuracy of financial information represents a level zero. So if that's all that I'm doing in this role, I cannot assess myself at a level two at this point. I have to assess myself at level zero and maybe gain an understanding of what is required of me to get to the level one or to level two. As you can also see here within the level one subcompetency area, I have to at least hit two parts of this rubric. I have to explain the financial reporting information required by various stakeholders, plus either complete A or B. So analyze and identify the appropriateness of the basis of financial reporting or analyze the accuracy and reliability of the financial information. If I do not demonstrate this in my documentation, I cannot achieve a level one. So same goes with the enabling competencies. I would go back to my experience report and then click on my enabling competencies where I will then be brought to a page where I'm able to fill out the enabling competencies that I feel are appropriate for the experience report that I'm reporting. Again, I would like to draw your attention to the blue information icon where you will see here that the enabling competencies rubric um, follow the CPA way. So for those of you, and that is most likely most of you who just wrote core one, you know that um, the standard for documenting your cases is the CPA way, and we've adopted this CPA way into the enabling competency documentation as a requirement. So there are six parts to it, and again, you would adopt the CPA mindset, so discuss what value, uh, what CPA value you are addressing assess the situation. So to achieve a level two, again, you would have to provide more than one viable alternative. Um, analyze the issue. So again, analyze both alternatives, create pros and cons and so forth, um, and then follow the rest of the rubric. So again, we would want to see a, a great conclusion, a recommendation, and definitely discuss who your stakeholders are in this, in this competency. And also, we want to see that you have had some reflective thought. So you give yourself feedback of what you would do differently next time. The next thing I would like to show you in PERT is the Consolidated Summary tab. So we're moving away from the Experience Report tab to the Consolidated Summary tab. What you can do in here is click within all of your reports, so you can click all of your active reports and assess 
where you are to meeting the practical experience requirements. So in this case, I've included all three of these reports and I'm gonna click on Assess. And now your consolidated summary will read what's required of you. So here I know that I've reported um, 4.6 weeks of leave, which means I still only um, am required to report at least 30 months duration. Again, as you can see to the right of the 4.6 weeks, we do allow for 20 weeks of leave. Um, so my leave time has not Im impacted my duration required. It'll show you what type of experience you've, you've reported so far and your total reported duration. So as I can see here, I've not met my minimum requirement yet. It'll also show me my core depth, breadth, and enabling per, uh, status within my experience report. As you can see here, I've not met all five of my enabling competencies yet, but I have met within the 25 months of my experience, my core depth and breadth. It will also show you a summary in all the selections. So in this case, I've only reported a level one in problem solving and decision making, and I've yet to report anything else. And again, it'll show you a summary of your technical. So again, this is a great tool to use to keep track of how you're progressing through the program. Keep in mind though that your experience reports, if they are set to a verified status, have not been reviewed by CPA Ontario, um, and unless they have been marked reviewed, have not obviously been assessed by an assessor. I will next talk about recording mentor reviews in PERT. So again, it is important to meet with your mentor within your first six months of reporting in PERT just to make sure you both have set your expectations and have started doc documenting your mentor reviews in PERT. You are required to document two formal mentor reviews in PERT for every 12 months of current experience reported. So this really means for every 12 months after your per effective date date in PERT, you need to have two mentor reviews documented, which is why we advise most students to do it every six months. You may definitely have informal mentor reviews that can take place as often as you need that you do not need to report in PERT. So um, it's also important to update and have your experience reports verified by your supervisor if you're in the experience verification role before requesting a mentor review. Another great tool is the next mentor review date that can be populated so that you can be sent a reminder to complete your mentor review. How should you request a mentor review? So if you have at least one report in a verified status, all you have to do is log into PERT, navigate across those tabs that we were just looking at, and click on Mentor Review. And again, look for something clickable. So in this case, we have our blue clickable area, which is the Request Review. And you would request a mentor review, and your mentor will be notified that you want to have a mentor review. It's your mentor's responsibility to document um, what you guys discussed in your mentor review and complete the mentor review in PERT. So your mentor will have their own separate login. So again, as a summary, students are responsible for requesting the mentor review in PERT. You're responsible to complete two mentor reviews for every 12 months of practical experience. If you are in a co-op term, you should have one for every co-op term, even if your co-op term is four months. Requested reviews that were completed by your mentor are the only reviews that will count towards these requirements. So again, if you have been meeting informally on and off over the past 12 months, but never documented in PERT, you would count as not having any mentor reviews over the last 12 months. Why is this important? Because if you do not report two mentor reviews for every 12 months ex of experience, you will lose out on 30 days of recognition. So what does that mean? If you had 12 months of current experience documented in PERT and no mentor reviews, you would then be required, so you should have had two mentor reviews. This would mean that now you are added on another 60 days of experience requirement. So instead of a minimum of 30 months duration, you will now have to meet a minimum of 32 months duration. 
Another important thing to note is that the assessor will assess whether um, your mentor reviews are appropriate. So we say that you know the best practice is every six months. However, if we see a student have two mentor reviews within a couple days from each other just to meet this, um, this deadline of every two for every 12 months, we will not deem this appropriate. The minimum duration between mentor reviews that we feel is appropriate is anywhere between 60 to 90 days and should be documented as such. The last thing I would like to discuss with you is the profession assessment. So what does this even mean? So as you are um, documenting your self-assessments in PERT um, and completing your mentor reviews, none of this is being submitted to CP Ontario until you take action to submit a profession assessment. So you would need to submit a profession assessment to CP Ontario at different points of your journey depending on what route you're taking. If you are in the experience verification route, you would need to submit a 12-month profession assessment to us and, obviously, an assessment to us at the time of completion. The reason why we say you should submit a 12-month profession assessment to us is because we want to make sure you are on the right track in your role because, as different from the pre-approved program, we have not pre-approved your role. So this is a great time to get some feedback by CPA reviewer um, and really start taking some time to document your experience and making sure you are, in fact, on the right track. In a pre-approved program, a, pre a student may only submit for a profession assessment when they have completed their program. So we do not need to check in within the first 12 months with a student in a pre-approved program because we have already done the work up front with the company um, to understand that within that 30 months, the student will experience the required, um, I guess, roles or tasks to then meet the practical experience requirements. Another reason why a student must submit a profession assessment is if they are leaving their role. So they're changing a job um, or you have yet to report your practical experience to us and you're submitting a pre-assessment. The average time that an assessment takes with CP Ontario can range, but at maximum it will take six weeks to process. How do you submit a profession assessment? Well, again, along those tabs in your PERT profile, the last one is profession assessment. You would click your assessment reason. So again, we went through some of these. You would submit a change of job if you were changing employers or changing roles within your employer. You would submit a 12-month assessment if you are an EVR student who has had 12 months in their current role. Completion, should you be ready to meet the practical experience requirement. And a student may request for CP Ontario to review their practical experience should they wish by requesting a student requested. And if CP Ontario has asked you to report additionally uh, over and above the 12 months, um, then you would request for a profession assessment, the profession requested assessment as the profession. CP Ontario has requested that you submit to us. The last piece I did want to to address with everybody is some really great resources we have available for students on our website. Um, and so you can get a copy of these slides in the handout section of this webinar. So all of these can be clickable within that PDF. You will also receive a recording of this webinar. Um, but some really great tools here are user guides on how to use PERT depending on what role you're taking. We have a quick reference guide um, on how to use PERT, as well as a guide to completing experience verification reports. We have the CPA Way Mindset Fact Sheet, so if you wanted to dig a little bit deeper in the six steps to achieve the CPA Way, you can click on that. We also have an enabling competency rubric, so an outline for you um, to see what the rubric has or what, what the requirement is within the rubric. How to request a mentor review. We have our CPA Ontario Practical Experience webpage. On our webpage, we have a great area with frequently asked questions, which you can find on the next link, and another great area with archived webinars. So we host webinars once a month for students, and the topic varies. Um, so if you are, let's say, an experience verification student and want a little bit more insight on the technical competencies, in October, we hosted a webinar that goes through each competency area and we discussed what exactly we look for as reviewers. So if you were to 
to start reporting your practical experience and needed some help or clarification on the technical competencies, visiting this link would be a great resource to you. I will um, take some time now for questions if we had any, um, any that are applicable to other students, but you can continue to ask your questions through the question uh, bar in our webinar and um, we'll, I guess, leave it open for the next 15 or so minutes. But this is the end of the informational piece of the webinar and now we will be taking questions and answers. So were there any questions here? Oops. Uh, we did have a question early on, Amanda. Um, how do I create my first experience report? And per I wonder if you could just um, show them again how they would log into PERT. Um, you had that slide, and and, uh, and just the first few steps. So as as you uh, get into PERT, you'll you'll be instructed on the next step as you go. So the first important step is just to get into PERT. Definitely. So you can log into PERT through the CPA Ontario website. And sorry, I'm just going back on some of these slides. Um, and so on the, um, so you would log into PERT and on this landing page, when I get to these experience reports, so on this landing page right here is what you would see when you log into PERT. And so just below this area um, where you have the experience reports, there would be a clickable area that says create an experience report. This is available for everybody. So you would click on create experience report, um, which you would see on this page. So if you wanted to take a second and log into your own PERT account to make sure you see this when you log in, um, it would say create an experience report. And you would just click on that and you would be able to fill out the details of your experience report therein. So should you be uh, reporting prior experience or current experience, you would be able to select that. If you were on a secondment, you would be able to document that as well, full-time or part-time, whatever it might be. Um, but again, it would be on this specific page that you would find on the experience reports tab. Um, we had another question. Could you explain to us the difference between when you're uh, creating your experience report and you're, you're putting in your technical enabling competency development, what's the difference between target proficiency, self-assessed proficiency, and profession assessed proficiency? Great question. So there are three proficiencies that you'll see when you're filling out your experience report. And let me just forward into this technical area so you, we can see it together. Um, so we have three areas. We have a target proficiency, um, a self-assessed proficiency, and later on you'll be able to see a profession assessed proficiency. So your target proficiency would be where you want to be in this specific subcompetency area by the time you're ready to qualify. So by the time you're done those 30 or so months, um, by the time you're done the end of, you know, you've completed your practical experience. So again, for a pre-approved program, your target per target proficiency will already be filled out. Um, but for those in the experience verification route, you sort of want to map out in the beginning of all of this where you hope to be and at the end of your, you know, your practical experience requirement um, term to see if you even in your role will be able to be exposed to all these areas. So you would set your target as where you want to be when you're done. And then your self-assessed would be, well, where do I feel like I am right now? So you can assess yourself at a zero, a one, or a two. And then when you submit a profession assessment to CPA Ontario to review your experience reports, the profession assessed proficiency will be where the CPA Ontario reviewer feels that you are based on your response or duration or combination of both. Awesome. Thank you. And then a related question. Do we need to report all three levels? Or if we feel we're at level two, can we just report level two? Most definitely, you don't need to start at a zero if you're not doing the work of a zero um, and, and or a one. Uh, and if you really think you're at that level of, you know, the level two, so maybe you've been in your role and now you've decided to complete your CPA, um, you have exposure, let's say, to completing financial statements um, and the entire financial statement and the notes, and so you feel like you're at that level two already, you don't need to fake your way to the level two. You can definitely start reporting at that level two. What we mean when we say progression is if a student, let's say, is maybe working on a section of the statements, 
um, or maybe assisting with adding um, and doing the reconciliations for the statements, that would really be a level zero. Um, and then we would hope that the student would then progress to level one and be able to complete sections of the statements and then continue to progress to complete either the full section, the full statements, or some more complex areas of the statements. But if you're already there, you definitely don't need to show the progression. Um, but we just want everybody to be mindful about what it really means to be at that level two because often we find students either um, aggressively reporting and are really not there, or perhaps you are there, but you're not documenting to that level two standard. So keep those two things in mind if you are reporting a level two, that you need to be confident that you're there and your documentation should be able to really support that. And so the more clear and concise and the more examples you provide, the better it is for the reviewer to genuinely agree with your self-assessed proficiency. Ah, here's a good question. Uh, again, related to that, are you able to change your target proficiency if your career path changes? Definitely. That's a great question. So let's say you, you know, were first in a role and you're doing financial reporting, um, and then maybe 10 months in you said, hey, you know, this is, isn't for me. I might want to do tax for a living. Most definitely um, in your final experience report to close off the experience of your old role, you can reassess all your target proficiencies for that role and self-assess as well. Um, and then when you start your new role, you would create a new experience report and then you would be able to set your new targets for completion. So Amanda's just looking at another question. Um, in the meantime, um, Amanda, I, there is a question about prior experience and the student situation, and this is common for a lot of students we're finding. Mm -hmm. So this student has five months at their job currently, but they don't have a per effective date. So what would be the steps the student needs to take in order to make sure that that experience they've already completed, those five months, does get assessed, and I believe we have asked this question, but maybe we need to clarify. Right, so good question, um, and we do find that a lot of students may not have um, gotten into PERT in a timely manner, so they definitely do either, whether it be that their PER effective date sort of cuts them off midway through their start date and, the, and, and present, or uh, they have prior experience, but basically any time before your PER effective date, so again, you log into your profile, let me just pull that up again, you log into your profile here and you can see um, on your profile in, in point blank the per effective date. So in this student's case, it's July 18, 2016. Any experience before this date that you have, you would be able to click on a create new experience report. You would select the report type as a prior report. So whether it be a prior pre-approved program report or prior experience verification report, you can document this time there. So should you have five months, 10 months, or even if you have 25 months, you can document all that experience, but be uh, mindful that your prior experience is capped at 12. Thank you. Um, we also have a question that I think is important to call out. So the question is, are the fees associated with prior experience reports? Good question. Right now, CP Ontario is not charging for prior experience reports, so we definitely recommend that you submit a prior experience report, um, document, you know, everything, and spend some time documenting, especially because, you know, if it's a former employer, you'll have to send it to your supervisor for review. Um, your supervisor would get the report to assess um, the accuracy of the, of the information reported. So uh, once you do that and it's ready to go, you would submit it for a profession assessment and you would ask CPA Ontario, essentially, you would submit for a student requested and you would ask for CPA Ontario to review your prior experience and we would review it. Um, and so you want to make sure that you're spending uh, a good amount of time documenting because you don't want us to send it back to you for more clarification and then go back to your former employer and, and do this whole song and dance. So you want to make sure you really spent enough time your first time to uh, give it a good scrub and make sure you're comfortable with what you're reporting and then submit it to us. But in short, no, we are not charging for experience reports at the present time. 
For a student who has prior experience from a couple of years ago and isn't sure whether their old supervisor is still there, what should they do? Great question. So most definitely we've come into scenarios where maybe students, former supervisors have left the company. Um, you should definitely reach out as a first step to the company's HR department and ask if the supervisor is there and if so to get the supervisor's contact information and ask them if they'd be comfortable signing off. If the supervisor has since left um, and there's really no one there who left who can um, who directly supervised you who could sign off you can ask the human resources team to um, be your supervisor and attach a, and get a letter um, explaining you know the start and end date of, of your um, your work experience there and a brief overview of what your role was and then we would leave it up to the CPA Ontario reviewer to assess if what you have reported is is accurate um, and reasonable. And related to that, how far back can you go? So like I said, you can go back up to five and a half years um, to report your practical experience. And we say that because um, a student, when you're ready to, to submit for completion, all of your experience needs to be within the past seven years. So we cap you at going back five and a half years to make sure that everything that you've, ex uh, you've reported is within that seven-year period. Um, what about experience gained outside of Canada? Mm -hmm. of? of course, so we definitely accept international experience. All of the international experience has to be done through the experience verification route. Unless you are working for a pre-approved program and going on a secondment, you can report that experience. So let's say you worked for a pre-approved program um, and they sent you to an office in, I don't know, the US or Europe um, for six months, you can report that experience as a secondment in PERT and it would essentially be treated like an experience verification report. But otherwise, if a student's working um, abroad and not in Canada, you can definitely actually not even within Canada, with anywhere outside of Ontario, you would be treating it as um, an experience verification report. Amanda, we've had a few questions. I wonder if you could go over this again. When a student is reporting their experience, can you explain to us the difference between the statuses of the report? News, Good question. question, mm -hmm. verified, mm -hmm. and review. So your status of your experience report, um, as you can see here in this area, right now all of these are set to verified. So there are several statuses, I guess, that would come up um, in your experience report. So if you were to click on create a new experience report and create the report but never click on submit, your report status would be new. So that means it's open, it's in draft, you can edit it. The second you click on submit, if you are a pre-approved program student, the status would be set to verified. If you click on submit and you're an experience verification student, it would go to verification requested, which would mean that an email has been sent to your supervisor to first agree to the accuracy of what you have reported. Your supervisor would click on the supervisor declaration and, and agree to what you've reported and leave some notes. Once they've done that, your status will also change to verified. At this point, when they're set to verified, you are able to request for mentor review. Um, when you submit a profession assessment and CP Ontario has reviewed your report, the status will switch to reviewed. It will show duration recognized in the duration recognized column and you would have feedback within your experience report from the reviewer. If at any time you go into a verified report and edit it without reselecting submit, your report status will be set to follow up. Thank you, Amanda. So to clarify for those who are asking questions about it, you cannot edit a reviewed experience report. You have to have create a new one or have it in verified status. But you can edit a verified experience report. So related to that, Amanda, how often should you update mm -hmm. or create a new experience report? Yeah, great question. So uh, we recommend students to either update, so you can either reopen and update your experience report so you could change the end date and, and keep extending it, or create a new one every six months. So that's a recommendation is every six months to report. Again, so that you can report in a timely manner, submit your experience report, have it verified, and then have a mentor review, and do this all within, again, twice 
for every 12 months of experience after your perfective date, and again, within a reasonable time period in between. Um, could you briefly explain the differences between the experience verification route and the pre-approved program route? Sure, absolutely. So the, the real main difference between the pre-approved program route and the experience verification route is that um, the technical competencies in the pre-approved program route have been agreed upon between the employer and CP Ontario and are already mapped in for the student. Um, otherwise, the student will still have to meet the core depth and breadth requirement. The students both still have to have their mentor reviews and, and be held to those standards. They're both supervised and they're both required to, to have CP Ontario trained mentors. Um, so the real difference there is when reporting their practical experience for the students in the pre-approved program route, your technical will be pre-populated. And for those in the experience verification route, again, because CP Ontario and your employer have not worked together to preset um, an agreed upon path of uh, 30 months path for you, you as a student there, um, you have to document to CP Ontario what you're doing to achieve those sub-competency areas and we will assess that for you. Another, I guess, difference is in the pre-approved program route, your mentor must work at your organization. If you're an experience verification route, your mentor can work anywhere. Thanks, Amanda. To go back to um, the experience reports and the details behind that, can you explain the difference between experience report created for a pre-assessment for the experience verification route and an experience report created to report your experience? Great question. So when you're first getting into PERT, and part of your core one assignment, for those of you who had not been into PERT yet, um, was to create a pre-assessment if you're in the experience certification pathway. And really all that's required for the pre-assessment phase is a copy of your job description. So you would have created an experience report, you would have put in the details of your employer and how long you've worked there and all that good stuff on the report details tab. So you would have filled out this tab of the report. Um, but you would have not filled out the technical or enabling competency areas because right now all you were asking CP Ontario to do is to assess whether your job qualifies. And how we as reviewers do that is you would have clicked on the attachments tab and attached a copy of your job description on company letterhead. And us as reviewers would have read your um, job description and ensured there was at least an opportunity to achieve one level one in any of the 20 sub-competency areas. So that was the entry requirement to be, meant to be in a qualifying role with CP Ontario, is one level one in your experience report. Um, and then we would have reviewed your experience report, it gave you zero months duration, and essentially all that report means is that we have approved your experience, um, approved your role, and set you to in progress. So you were, you'd be able to start reporting your practical experience. So once you were approved, you could then report your experience in your experience report and fill out all of the tabs. Report details, technical competency, and enabling competency. So basically you repeat the dates of that report. Exactly. Yeah, you would repeat your start and end date, and then you would be able to fill out the technical and enabling competency now that you know CP Ontario agrees that your role is qualifying. Awesome. For those students who have a report with zero duration, if you're in progress, you're approved for reporting, don't panic, just create your experience report. Um, now we have a question here about how do I find a mentor? Um, so, are you able to answer that? You go I'll, I'll answer that. So I'm, I'm the manager of the mentorship program. Uh, for experience verification students, we have a mentor search portal. You do have to be in PERT first. And then you can email us and ask to have access to it, um, and we'll be able to give you the ability to search through PERT and reach out to uh, approve mentors through the MentorMatch portal. Now, this way you'll be able to reach out to mentors, but you won't know them. So we do recommend starting through your own networks. They're the best place to find a good CPA mentor, someone who works in your organization, someone who you have worked with in the past, maybe through your education, you met them, a professor, a teacher, someone like that. Uh, in the experience verification route, your mentor can be any approved CPA mentor. For pre-approved program students, you'll be assigned a mentor when you're approved into the program. 
I see a good question here. It says, so do I have to meet all the requirements within PERT before I can get my CPA designation? The answer is yes. Um, you need to meet your education and your practical experience requirements before you can be admitted to membership. So again, it does not mean you need to meet all 20 SIP competencies, but again, you need to meet your core depth and breadth within the technical competencies and all of your enabling at a level two. Um, and the core depth and breadth can technically be achieved with only four level ones and four level twos if they're all mapped according, uh, appropriately. So we, we have a technical question here. Uh, will the webinar be available for viewing after? Yes, so as a registrant to the webinar, you'll be emailed a link to this webinar. As well, again, at the resources page I showed you at the end of this presentation, there was a link to the area of our CPA Ontario webinar section where all past webinars, uh, links and recordings have been posted as well. So not only will you be able to access this webinar there within the next few business days, but you'll also be able to access any past webinars we posted. Uh, thanks, Meta. So jumping back to a mentor-related question, does your mentor have to be your supervisor? No, your mentor does not have to be your supervisor, but they can be. So your mentor can have a dual role. They can be your reporting manager, your supervisor, and your mentor. We do recommend having a conversation with your supervisor slash mentor if you choose to go down this route. Uh, just to have a discussion around how this will affect your working relationship. Your mentor will play two different roles. Supervisor, where they are uh, verifying that the report, the information you're putting in there is correct, and your mentor, where they're there to support and guide you in your development. So have a conversation with them about that. But yes, your mentor can be a supervisor and a mentor at the same time. They can also be a past supervisor. They can, they can be anyone who is a CPA approved mentor. Now, to get approved, they have to be a member in good standing of CPA Ontario or a provincial body. And then there is a one-hour webinar series they need to watch and a registration form that takes approximately two days to be approved. No, so we will um, stay online to answer any outstanding questions that you have asked. We will end the webinar. So this is the conclusion, the end of the webinar. Thank you very much for attending um, and taking ownership of your CPA future designation. We really appreciate it. Um, another thing you can always keep your eyes and ears out is for future webinars. If you do have questions, you can email practicalexperience at cpaontario.ca.